So the plot device has finished baking, we return from our other plot device, and it's time to get to the goal of the plot, the suicide mission. Now it's called the suicide mission because whomever goes through the relay never returns. So now that we have a way to use the relay, now would be a good time to start running some tests on the thing. Like sending a small ship, maybe a shuttle, or even a probe would work. But instead of doing any kind of recon on our goal to ensure we might have a chance of being successful, we just bull rush the thing. Now, I can understand why Smudboy is making this argument and why certain people might think this way, because the reasons for uh, going straight through the relay aren't as apparent as they might seem. Um, but there are reasons for doing it. Uh, the first one being, if you're playing a Paragon Shepherd, you're not going to want to wait and waste the time it would take to do that. Every second you waste is a second your crew could die, and this is proven by the game by the fact that if you take your sweet time, the, all your crew members are killed. So if you're a Paragon Shepherd, you're going to want to rush through there, take the risk, to get to your crew as fast as possible. So let's say you're a renegade, you don't give a damn about your crew. Well, you still have the best chance of success by being the first one through the relay. The biggest thing Shepard has going for him is the element of surprise. The collectors don't think you can touch them where they live. They're not expecting you. The second you send through a ship, probe, or anything, and they pick it up, that element of surprise is gone. The next time you go through that relay, they will be waiting for you, and your chances of survival just got that much thinner. The Normandy is the only stealth ship they have, and while it might be debatable whether or not the stealth systems are actually effective against the Collectors, the Collectors seem to have found them at the begin beginning of the game, however they didn't seem to pick them up on Horizon since they were caught completely by surprise, so maybe there were enhancements made to it, but either way it doesn't matter. The Normandy is the only one that has any sort of chance of making it through that relay stealthily. Anytime you send a, a probe or a ship that will be picked up, you've completely thrown away your, your only real advantage, which is surprise. The point was to put together a team of specialists so that you could be the first one through the gate, use that element of surprise to your advantage, and hopefully be prepared enough to face whatever you came across. That was the whole point. But because of our guaranteed land war in Asia, after we fight the cruiser, Shepard recommends we get in close to finish them off. Get in close and finish them off. Because a ship several times the size of ours, which is part mountain, won't possibly have any debris or cause any explosions that might hurt us while we're shooting at it. Up close. Oh wait. It will. Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh, oh. Shepard's tactics aren't the problem here. Yes, he told Joker to get closer so that the collectors would have trouble using their giant laser while they finished it off. But Joker's not an idiot. He was not close enough to the collector ship when it blew up that debris was a serious threat. What hit the Normandy was a shockwave from the explosion, which tend to travel at extremely high speeds for very long distances which means there was nothing the Normandy could have done at any range to avoid getting hit by the shockwave, which is what took out their field generators. Alright, um, let's save a little bit of time here. Uh, Spudboy then goes on to talk about uh, choosing the who's going to be the tech expert, who's going to be the second team squad leader, and the complexities of who's a good choice and who's not. And a lot of this is opinion and circumstance, and he even says that it's kind of not clear. Maybe someone would be good, maybe they wouldn't. It wasn't perfect. But it was the first time any game maker ever tried doing something like this. And what game maker gets things perfectly the first time? It's very rare. The, the, the idea was to create an atmosphere where you're not sure what's going to happen and you're on the edge of your seat. And the majority of the people who played the suicide mission felt that exact feeling. So let's just say this. I thought it was action packed. I thought it was tense. I thought it was really well done. Could they have done a little better? Sure. Uh, and I'll, I'll give that. But uh, let's move on to the next stage of the uh, suicide mission, shall we? For the biotic bubble babe, once again Miranda acts as the tutorial leader and says, I could do it too. In theory, any biotic could handle it. Yeah, thanks Miranda. Now the obvious choices are the two powerful biotics, Jack or Samara, or Morinth if you're a sadistic idiot or just a completionist. The question becomes, why couldn't they both maintain the field? Seems like a pretty grueling task to start playing Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles with your mind. Why not bring both along? Okay, yes, but we're dividing up into two teams again, remember? Uh, so you wouldn't want to send one of the biotic bubble babes with the other team in case they happen to run into some secret drones too? 
No? Okay, fine. Wow, way to be sacrificial. Sure, we protect Shepard, but what about everyone else? No, it makes more sense to send your one bi powerful biotic with you and one powerful biotic with the other team. Even if they weren't expecting to run into Seeker drones, it doesn't mean they can't, and at this point you're going to be careful for that kind of thing. Now this is weird, because at this point I'm thinking, wouldn't Jacob have been perfect? <laughs> I know, a very weird comment to make about Jacob. I say this because Jacob's loyalty skill is called Barrier, which is the only shield skill that makes a biotic field covering his body to protect him from injury. Hmm, that sounds handy. Okay, couple problems with that. First and foremost, just because Jacob has this as a loyalty power doesn't mean no one else is capable of doing it. It also doesn't mean that Jacob's the best at doing it, but hey, let's say that he's really good at making a barrier around himself. Well, point number two is that there's a big difference between covering yourself in a barrier and covering an entire group in a barrier. It's a difference of power, which Jacob does not have. Jacob is nowhere near as strong as Samara or Jack. So even if he has the technical skill down better than everyone else, he still doesn't have the juice to pump it out long enough. When you actually play through the level, you notice that it's not a matter of who creates the best bubble, because they all create a sufficient bubble. It's who holds it long enough to make it to your destination, which is all about endurance and strength in the biotics, which Jacob obviously does not have. So it doesn't matter if he makes the most fantastic barrier in the world if it only stays up for 30 seconds. And now we come to one of the most debated topics in Mass Effect 2, the last boss. Was it a good boss? Was it a bad boss? Was it absolutely ridiculous? Um, here, let me show you Smudboy's views on it. The last boss is a massive cybernetic baby biped reaper made of liquid humans, minus the biped, and an embryonic stage of growth. There's several things horribly wrong with this. One, shape and size, and why? Why is this thing in the shape of a human with three eyes? Okay, so it has three eyes. Big whoop. So it doesn't have to follow the human genetic structure exactly. Just take the basic shape and characteristics of a human. Husks have had three eyes since Mass Effect 1, so it's not like this is some new concept. Why is it huge? What possible use would a giant human-shaped cybernetic triclops be? They weren't making it into the shape of a human because they thought it'd be fun to look at. They didn't actually have a plan with it. It's just that the Reaper takes the shape of whatever species used to create it. Like this. They're building it to look like a human. Why? It appears that a Reaper's shape is based upon the species used to create it. See? It's not like they really have a choice. If they want to use humans to make a Reaper, which they figure is the best option for making a new Reaper, it's going to look like a human. Aren't Reapers supposed to be giant, non-organic ships? Incorrect. Reapers are sapient constructs, a hybrid of organic and inorganic material. The exact construction methods are unclear, but it seems probable that the Reapers absorb the essence of a species, utilizing it in their reproduction process. 2. Liquid humans? What does liquid Soylent Green do? Now, I can understand if you're destroying a certain organ, let's say a muscle, and breaking them down into tissues, and you can use that as a building material for a giant muscle organ. That kind of makes sense. But melting everything down? That's just dumb. We were led to believe Reapers were these super old AIs who look at organics as ants. So what would grafting this blended mess of inferior organic goo into a logical, efficient, giant robot? What's the possible benefit here? I'm sorry, could you point to where in the game that it says that they are simply melting down the human body and then throwing that whole pile of goop into the Reaper? They said they're processing it, meaning refining or changing in some shape or form. If you look at the stuff being pumped into the Reaper, it's glowing orange. How many piles of human goop do you know that glow orange? It means that they changed it in some shape or form to be fitted to the Reaper. I don't understand how you think that they're just throwing some huge blood protein shake into a Reaper. 3. Time to completion? Apparently this will take several decades to complete if we understand that the collectors need millions of humans. Well, okay, well first of all, what kind of weird logic are you using to think it's going to take decades to complete this thing? Uh, she said it's going to take millions more. Now, not tens of millions, so let's ref roughly estimate, say, 9 million people. Okay? Well, 
if you look, the number of people on Freedom's Progress was over 900,000 that were all abducted. The number of people on Horizon was over 600,000. Of course, they only got about half of them, but let's pretend that they had plans to get all of them. So let's say that the average colony they hit has maybe 500,000 people. Putting it low, okay? Rounding down, so to speak. Well, that means that you get about a million colonists for every two colonies you hit. And considering the fact that they just hit Freedom's Progress when the game started, and maybe, maybe two weeks later they hit Horizon, let's give them a schedule of hitting a colony once every two weeks or so. Well, if you're collecting half a million people every time you hit a colony, and you need nine million people, that's only 18 abduction, uh, abducted colonies. And if you're hitting them at a, a process of about, you know, every two weeks, that's like nine months. In fact, it makes more logical sense to sit there and wonder why it's taken them two years to get as far as they did. Of course, if you think about it for a second, they probably were just ramping up. In other words, they started off small, capturing much less to see what they could get away with, and when no one reacted, they started taking more and more. But in any case, by the time that you're into the, the finale of the game, you're talking nine months, if that. Maybe a year, if you want to stretch it out. Hell, I'll even give you two years. Two years till completion. But decades? Come on! How is this plan B? Wasn't the main plot to open the Citadel Relay and let all the Reapers in to start the next cycle of destruction? Unless Harbinger's just insane and messing with us? Let's assume this is plan B. The next Reaper will make a second attempt on the Citadel. Traveling would be too long for the other Reapers to come in, so I guess it's safer and faster to make a new one. Now let's follow this line of logic. If the Collectors are successful by collecting enough humans from Alliance Council space without being detected or destroyed by them, if they can build a ship for their new Human Reaper, if they can also build an armada to take on the Alliance Council Citadel that was at least comparable if not larger than Sovereign's armada, if during after all these years the Alliance Council fleet aren't larger or have better technology or more ships to take them on considering they were previously attacked, then the Collectors and their new Reaper might be able to take the Citadel successfully. I mean, is that the plan? Because that's a really bad plan. Wow, you're right. That plan sucks. It's a good thing the logic behind that plan is completely faulty, otherwise I'd probably just suggest the Reapers uh, go on to plan C. They might have a better shot at that. Lucky for us, the logic behind this plan makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. First of all, there's no evidence stating that they would even have to go into Alliance space. We don't know how many humans live in the Terminus system, and we don't know how many more humans they still need to finish this project. It's very likely that they could get everyone they need in the Terminus system. The only evidence you might have is that a squad member states that they could fill uh, the pods with everyone in the Terminus system and still have pods left over, but that's not a real number. We don't know how many pods are on that ship, so that doesn't really make any sort of statement one way or the other. And they've already demonstrated for two years that they can take entire colonies without serious repercussions. What makes you think they can't do it for another nine months? Then you go on to say that they would need to build some sort of ship for the little baby that they're making now. Why? It's a Reaper. It will just fly through space on its own, like all the other Reapers do. Those ships that you seem to be talking about? are Reapers. What they're building is a Reaper, which means that it will be able to float through space on its own. And while we may think that it's a little silly for something human-shaped to float through space, I doubt the Reapers really care what we think is silly. And if you think about it, that's probably a lot more useful than a ship that looks like a squid.